Well, good morning, Heritage Bible Church. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, again, we are excited that uh, we're starting to gather a little bit here and there. And uh, this is kind of our trial test run church service for what uh, next week will look like. So we're looking forward to seeing um, you very soon. Um, but until that time comes, would you uh, just tune your hearts into the Holy Spirit this morning and uh, just ask the Lord to speak to you in a new, fresh way. We know that every time we go to the Word, we sit under a teaching that uh, God will give us new revelation um, and change us in ways that we couldn't possibly do on our own. So God, we ask of that uh, this morning before we start this service. Lord, would you speak to us in a new way? Would you speak to us in a fresh way? God, help us to not be... Uh, content with what we have known, Lord, but help us to want you more, God, to, to desire more of you, Lord. We know that you are vast and you can never be fully contained, explained, researched, Lord, and so we're just eager and hungry for more of you, Lord. Would you fill us today? We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Sing it again, open up the heavens. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our Every part of our brain. 
Jesus, you are the center of our lives. You're the center of our church. The center of it all. God, during this time, is it may be so easy to lose that focus. Would you remind us, God, that you are in control, you are in charge, you are the center. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. Shall confess you, Jesus. 
just sing his name this morning. Jesus, 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 you're our Jesus, all the power belongs to Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank uh, David Newton for uh, preaching last Sunday and filling in for me. Uh, Annette and I were planning on going to the coast for my birthday, and that got canceled the day during, while we were packing. And uh, so we spent last weekend in Bakersfield, enjoying my birthday and celebrating it in various ways uh, during that time. Uh, well, today is our 11th, our 11th week of taping our worship service, so people can view the service online. Overall, the, the response has been positive uh, with people from, from other cities and even other states that are watching our service. We will continue taping the service even after we resume public services. Uh, we're going to do that uh, in a way as a ministry to, to our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even beyond. Uh, people are contacts that way. But many are wondering, and many of you are probably wondering, when will the church reopen for public worship? And I can tell you that today, and I have an answer to share with you in just a moment. During the last few weeks, I've been able to be part of numerous Zoom meetings with pastors, conference leaders, public health officials, political law, uh, leaders, as well as lawyers. Last week in a Zoom meeting, Shannon Grove, our state senator, uh, made this comment to us and said, uh, over 1,000 churches in California have already reopened. Many churches are, are planning on opening uh, today. But one of the best observations I heard about this entire experience came from uh, Pastor Forrest Jennon, who's pastor of Neighborhood Church in Visalia. He quoted a writer who... Uh, said that we need to view this season of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to view it not as a pause, but as a pivot. And he explained, if you, if you think of you know, the this, this last three months as a pause, when we're, we haven't been able to meet, and once churches are able to gather and, and once again resume services, if it's, if it's seen as a pause, people will think, well, church will just go back to normal. We took a three-month pause and now we're resuming. And I want to tell you, as you can probably figure out, that is not reality. That's not what is going to happen. Um, this season forces us to really make a pivot. In other words, uh, we have to make necessary changes in how we do church, especially at the beginning. And the elders met last Wednesday night and decided our Sunday morning worship service will resume in one week. We will start public services next Sunday. June 7th at 9.30. The service will be taped and available to view online in the afternoon. But your health and safety is a primary concern for us. To ensure this, we're going to initially pivot and we're not going to do some of our regular activities. For example, as, as you come to church next Sunday, if you're able to come, I want to encourage you to do not give handshakes or hugs. There will be no greeting time during the service, as we've often done. No drinks or food will be served. There will be no bulletin that gets passed out. We will make announcements verbally and, and on the screen. Uh, the offering bags will not be passed. Ushers will hold offering bags uh, in the back. Uh, as you leave, you can drop your offering in there, and we're grateful for many of you who continue to send in your offering. Uh, and if you are coughing, if you're sneezing, if you have a temperature, then we hope you enjoy the service online. Uh, and listen, if you don't feel comfortable coming, and I've already talked to people who are already a little hesitant about coming, and if you are uncomfortable and hesitant about you know, health issues uh, and you want to stay home, that's perfectly fine. We understand that. We respect that. Um, you can join us online, but uh, we know you're still part of our church family. 
Uh, I want to let you know personally, I, pl I plan on wearing a mask as people are entering. Uh, then I sit in the front row and I'll probably take it off during the service, put it back on at the end of the service as people are moving around and milling, milling around. Um, the CDC is not requiring masks for people to, to come to a church service. Uh, but I want to encourage you, maybe out of respect and concern for others, you may want to consider uh, wearing a mask maybe just initially or as, uh, as people are, are entering or exiting. Now, the governor has asked that we limit seating in churches in, in our rooms to 25% capacity, which uh, is roughly 60 people in our sanctuary. And, and here is my suggestion, which has been affirmed by the elders. Uh, if you plan on coming to uh, our worship service, you can reserve your seat. Uh, if you're planning on coming, we want you to call the church office. Let us know you, you plan on coming. Tell us how many in your family are coming, and we will reserve seats for you. Um, uh, now, chairs will be spread out. Chairs will be, uh, you know, we will practice social distancing with the chairs. Um, your seat uh, will have uh, a name on them. Uh, and the reality is that since most of you sit in pretty much the same uh, area of the sanctuary each week, we know where you sit. And we will reserve, reserve seats in that section for you. Um, okay? Um, and I want to tell you, the first 60 people that call into the church office each week will get a seat reserved in the sanctuary. Um, if you are not part of the 60 or if you forget to call each week, or if we have people just, you know, uh, come in off the street to attend our service, uh, I want to let you know that there will be seating available for, for uh, you in the social hall. Now, let's just talk about some nuts and bolts here. Uh, in our social hall, we have, we have small restrooms and a very narrow hall. And to encourage people to, to use those facilities and practice social distancing is nearly impossible. And so we're simply going to ask that one person at a time use our indoor restrooms here in the social hall. However, we will be able to take advantage of three outdoor restrooms that are just immediately outside uh, our sanctuary uh, near the nursery. There's part of Readyland, and we encourage uh, people to, to use those as well. A nursery will be provided, uh, and Jen Gonzalez will be organizing Heritage Kids, which is our children's ministry, uh, next Sunday. They will attend uh, with us at the beginning of the worship service with their families, and families will be allowed to, to sit together. Um, so the children will be part of our worship service. We, we will then dismiss kids. Jen will take them to our gymnasium where, can, where she can spread out kids and they can do their uh, regular activities. Um, at least for the time being, when we start, impact groups will not be meeting on campus uh, Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. Uh, some impact groups are already meeting through Zoom, uh, and some uh, impact groups can meet in a home these days. Now, the governor has set up these guidelines for 21 days, and then he wants to evaluate them. Um, and things, if, if you watch the headline, things seem to be changing almost every week. Um, so we just encourage you to be flexible, be fluid. If you have any questions at all, uh, please call the church office and one of the staff will be able to answer the question. On a personal note, during this pandemic, I decided to read through the book of Psalms. And I wanted to do that. Uh, and, and in reading through that, I wanted to find a specific Psalm that I would focus on and, and base our first public worship service on that Psalm. And so as I read through, I uh, decided on Psalm 33. Psalm 33 is going to be the basis for next week's uh, Sunday morning worship service. Based on that psalm, next Sunday is going to be a little different because it's going to be uh, a time of singing, a time of sharing testimonies. Uh, we will have, probably have some readings. I'm hope, hoping to have a video or two. Uh, but mainly next Sunday is a time of praise and a time of celebrating, being able to gather again as the people of God. We hope that you can join us, and we look forward to next Sunday. God bless you. Worship team will lead us in another song. Let me encourage you to stand as we sing this next song. Mm -hmm. 
we are going to be allowed to gather again in some form next week. It brings a lot of joy to my heart. And so I selected this song with that in mind. So would you sing with us? Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. Come on, you know it. Let's sing the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness, I'll dance. In the shadows, I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. When I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you, Lord. Though you shine with glory, Lord of light. Though you shine with glory, Lord of light, I feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say, I will praise you, Lord. Here we go. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When sorrow comes my way, you are the shield around me. Always remain my courage in the fight. I hear you call my name. Jesus, I am following, walking on the waves. Reaching for your light. Come on, let's sing it together. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance. In the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Last time. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, church, let's give Him praise. Amen. Amen. He is good. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We started a new series today on Old Testament prophets, a series called Prophets of Old Made Practical Today. Uh, Today is going to be an introduction to that topic. There is an outline on the church app if you want to follow along. Now, I imagine some of you hear that topic and say, oh, Old Testament prophets, why? (laughs) You hear that topic and you say, man, that is ancient history. It is boring. Those books are hard to read in the Bible. And I want, as your pastor, I I sympathize with that because that comment is true. Prophetical books are harder to read than other books, mainly because they're written uh, in Hebrew poetry. I mean, it's much easier. It's more fun to read narrative uh, stories. I'd I'd much rather read stories of, of Joshua at Jericho or David and Goliath. And prophets can be confusing. How many of you have ever heard the term major prophets or minor prophets? Have you heard those terms? Okay. In the Old Testament, there's three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then there are 12 minor prophets. You know, this last year, I spent eight or nine months preaching on the Gospel of John. And as I got near to the end of that series, someone asked me, well, you've been preaching on John a long time. What are you going to preach on next? 
And I said, well, this summer, I'm preaching on the minor prophets. And this person very innocently responded and said, are those the lesser prophets? And I explained, no, they're not the lesser prophets. Major and minor simply refer to the length of the prophet and their Latin terms, which Dan should appreciate. Minor prophets simply mean they're the shorter prophets. In the books, the minor prophets range from one chapter in length to, to 14 chapters uh, in length. This summer, I plan on, on preaching. Uh, me and the staff and myself are going to preach on 10 of the minor prophets. In ancient Israel, e uh, each of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, were able to be written on one long leather scroll. It took an entire scroll for each of the major prophets. But then all 12 of the minor prophets could be written out, and they also were on just one scroll. And so in Israel, those were known as the four prophetic scrolls. Let me show you an example of this. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, and the verses will be up on the screen as well. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth. And look what happens. We'll start in verse 16 said, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So Jesus goes to the synagogue. He wants to preach from Isaiah, and so the scroll of Isaiah is handed to him. Did you notice that? That was one of the prophetical scrolls. Now, a prophet was simply a spokesman for God. The word prophet literally means one who is called or one who calls. Many pastors and preachers today try to be creative and innovative when they, when they preach, but not Old Testament prophets. The job of the Old Testament prophet was to teach the Old Testament law that had, be, that had been given to Moses at, at Mount Sinai. Their job was to remind Israel of God's covenant with Israel. Their job was not to come up with new and creative teaching. Their, their curriculum had already been given to them. They just needed to repeat that. And in Old Testament times, nations and cultures were polytheistic, which meant they, it was common for, for people to worship a variety of gods at the same time. And people would do this through their idols. An idol represented your God, which meant your God was found in that idol. And therefore, that's how you worshiped your God, through the idol. Plus, you could take your idol with you if you were traveling, so you could worship with you, worship it as, as you traveled. It was common for people in the Old Testament cultures to, to have at least three gods. A person would, would be given a god at their birth. It was a personal god. They also had a, god, a family god, which represented their clan. And then it was common for people to have a national god, depending on which nation they were a member of. In the land of Canaan, which was a, an agricultural land, very similar, similar to the San Joaquin Valley, many farmers lived in the land of Canaan. And it was common for, for farmers in Canaan, would, they would have an idol for every crop so that that crop would be successful. So they may have six crops, they'd have six idols, one for each, each crop, plus they would worship Baal. Baal was the god of fertility, the god of rain. Every farmer worshiped Baal because they wanted crops to grow. So let me ask you, do people in America worship idols today? Absolutely. When you think about it, an idol is anything you are more devoted to than God. Here's another idea. We often don't think about this as an idol, but it really is. An idol is any idea, any concept that is unworthy of God. Because if you're believing or clinging to an idea that is, that is incorrect or unworthy of God, you know, you're, you're clinging to, you know, uh, it, it's a distortion of God's character. It's a distortion of God's nature. 
And in essence, that's a false idol. You're clinging, you're clinging, you're putting your belief in a false concept of God, and that's an idol. Though people may not call it uh, an idol, uh, people worship their possessions. They may worship uh, status or a title that they have. They may worship their possessions or, or their accomplishments. Colossians 3, 5 says, Don't be greedy for the good things in life, for that is idolatry. Old Testament prophets constantly confronted idolatry among the Israelites. They were tempted to, to worship like their neighboring uh, neighbors were in other countries. Uh, let me give you some examples of, of idolatry and social issues that Old Testament prophets uh, had to address. You tell me if it relates to today. First one, I'll just ask you some questions. You can raise your hand if you can answer this or relate to it. Do people today ever experience social injustice by being taken advantage of or abused? Does that happen today? We've seen that every day in the headlines. Minneapolis has been at the news all week because of the man who was taken advantage of and ended up dying, unfortunately, through the hands of the police. Gross social injustice. Look into the Old Testament. Amos and Micah, they mainly addressed social injustice. Another question, do you know people who are prejudiced or even racist? Anybody know people like that? Okay. Which of the 12 minor prophets does that probably describe the most? When you think of the, Roger will say, he will tell you the most popular minor prophet you can think of was probably the most prejudiced. Jonah. Jonah was told to go to certain people. He hated those people. He eventually got there. He took a detour, but he eventually got there. And when he got there, he preached and prayed that God would just would kill all of them with fire. And, it was, and he had preached, and, and they repented, and he was so disappointed because he's so prejudiced. Let me ask you another question. Do you know Christians that, that act religious but are just going through the motions? It, it, it's sort of a superficial faith. And I want to, that, is the, that is the message of the book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. Do you know Christians who always find something to do instead of going to church? Now, that doesn't describe any of you because you're here, you know. And we've got about 10 or 12 people in the audience today who we've invited to, to come. But we all know people like that. They always find something else to do other than coming to church. And I want to tell you that... Uh, that was the message of Haggai. These are all prophets we're going to be addressing. And then probably one of the most bizarre stories in the Old Testament. God wanted to show Israel how they were being unfaithful to him in their relationship to him. And so God had a prophet go out and find a woman of the street who was sexually immoral and marry her. So who was that prophet? Hosea. Hosea. Hosea was the lucky prophet who got that ministry assignment. When I, I told David that when I was in Dinuba, I, I did a series on the minor prophets, and when I thought of Hosea, I came up with a sermon title that seemed very appropriate. <laughs> and it was simply called Hosea and his hooker. <laughs> that, that got me in so much trouble. I think that's one of the reasons they... They uh, prayed I would uh, find a new ministry, but that's a different matter. When you think of Ho Hosea, you're dealing with the, 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 the very real issue of sexual immorality. That ties right in with American culture. Sex is worshipped as an idol in our country. Sex is a, a multi-billion dollar business and industry. So here's my question. Are Old Testament prophets relevant to our life today? You bet they are. The very issues that Old Testament prophets faced 2,500 to 3,000 years ago are the same issues today in the 21st century. Don't think of it as just old ancient history that is irrelevant. Their issues are, are they deal with, with life today. Things have not changed. But you, we have to, it's a challenge to read through those because you're reading through poetry that's, that's 24 to 28 centuries old.
But the God who spoke through Moses on Mount Sinai and spoke through Jesus in the New Testament also spoke through those minor prophets. And we're going to wade through that this summer and draw out the nuggets and make it relevant. So what are the prophetical books of the Old Testament? Open up the Bible that I placed near your seat. I want you to um, turn. This will be very simple. It's not like I'm asking you to find Obadiah. But I want you to turn to the table of contents. We'll start there. This should be very, fairly easy. That's at the beginning. The table of contents. If you find that, I want you to find the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is in the middle of the Old Testament. In fact, Isaiah is right after Song of Songs. Has everybody been able to find Isaiah? Okay. If you look at from Isaiah to the very last book of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, Isaiah to Malachi are all the prophetical books of the Old Testament. Okay? He said, who put, here's an interesting question, who put the Old Testament books in that order? Well, let me tell you, it was Christians in the first century that put the Old Testament books in that order that we have in, in our Bibles today. But it, it wasn't always in that order. It wasn't in the same order when Jesus read his Bible. In fact, in the second century B.C., two centuries before Jesus, there was a, an ancient uh, writing called Ecclesiasticus, Okay, that's different than Ecclesiastes, which is part of the Old Testament. Ecclesiasticus was a collection of wisdom sayings in the second century, and the author of that book, in referring to the Old Testament, which was the Jewish scripture at the time, when he referred to the the Old Testament scriptures, he described them as the, the law, the prophets, and the books of the fathers. What that meant was that, and, he, and the Old Testament in that, at that time, was in that order. In fact, the Old Testament in the second century B.C. went from Genesis to 2 Kings, and then you had Isaiah to Malachi, and then you had the rest of the Old Testament. Why? Why did they place them in that order? Because they wanted the prophets to be closely connected to the historical setting that they were written in. In fact, most of what occurs in the minor prophets and all the prophetical books can be summarized pretty much in First and Second Kings. That's the historical setting of all of the prophetical books. So that's why they connected those closely together. And that was the Bible that Jesus grew up reading. When, Christi- when Jesus came and, and he initiated the, the new covenant and rose from the dead and, and Christianity was, was created, essentially in the first century, It was Christians in the first century, they decided to change the order of the Old Testament. Because all of a sudden, they they began realizing, they looked at the life of Jesus, they had listened to all of his teachings, then they went back to the Old Testament and discovered that as they read through all of the prophetical books, many of them prophesied about Jesus. They saw hundreds of, of prophecies fulfilled that they hadn't ever seen before until Jesus had come. So they said, we should switch the order of the Old Testament. So they took all of the prophetical books that were in the middle of their Old Testament. They moved all those to the end of the Old Testament to connect it with the life of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. That's why we have the order that we have today. It wasn't always that way. There is another conf- confusing issue when you read the Old Testament. If you're familiar with Old Testament history, After Solomon's reign, there was a civil war in Israel. And the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Here's where things get confusing. So what did they call the northern kingdom? They called the northern kingdom Israel. And the southern kingdom was called Judah. Okay. Then my wife reminded me, Israel... um, was also the, the, another name for Jacob, you know, one of the patriarchs. And when I think of that, when I think of um, that, um, because here's, here's the problem. When, when you read in the, old, the prophetical books and, and you have a prophet who's preaching against Israel, 
You've got to ask the question, well, is he preaching to the whole nation? Or is he preaching to the northern kingdom? Or is that a reference to Jacob? You've got to figure that out. And, and that dilemma, it reminds me of a, of a TV show, and I know this is really going to date me, but it reminds me of a TV show that I watched way back in the 1970s, okay? The Bob Newhart Show. Now, if you remember that show at all, there were three brothers that always showed up in that show. And whenever they showed up and they would, they would meet Bob, they would introduce themselves. And one brother would get there and he'd say, Hi, I'm Larry. This is my brother, Daryl. This is my other brother, Daryl. How many remember that? Okay. You're old too, like me. Um, but, uh, and so that... Can, you know, in that family, that would have been confusing because you had two Daryls, and as you read through much of the Old Testament, you've got two or three Israels that people could, could uh, interpret that at. You know, it's easier to, to understand a prophetical book when you're able to put it in its historical setting and historical context. Um, let me illustrate that, um, the historical setting of the Old Testament uh, by using a, a couple of pillars here in, uh, in the, the sanctuary. Uh, imagine this, this western pillar it represents the year 1000 B.C. And the 1000 B.C. is the time of, of King David. Okay? So I've asked David Newton if he would come and stand. He's going to represent King David. I'm sure this is what uh, King David looked like uh, <laughs> as he ran around the temple. Okay, so th this is... That, that's, that's the time of David, 1000 BC. The pillar on the other side of the sanctuary represents the time of Jesus. And I've asked JD to represent uh, our Lord. Um, don't, don't let that go to your head. Um, and that the podium here roughly is about 500 BC. Okay? Um, most prophets in the Old Testament lived between 750 BC to 450 BC. Uh, now there are two dates that are very important to remember in trying to understand the Old Testament. The first date to remember is 722 BC. The reason that is important is 720, 722 BC is when the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of, of Israel, uh, was conquered by Assyria because of their idolatry. Uh, and then they were deported to Assyria. Now, for nearly 30 years prior to that event, Assyria had, had, Assyria had been attacking the, attacking the northern kingdom and, and conquering tribes in the northern uh, kingdom and deporting them to Assyria. Well, finally, in 722 was the final conquering date, and then every, everyone in the northern kingdom got deported. And it was during that time, during that, that time that uh, Assyria is... Uh, coming in and, and conquering people. God used uh, Amos and Hosea and Micah to, to preach to the northern kingdom, to Jews and uh, Israelites in the northern kingdom. That was the late 8th century BC. Well, a century later, Assyria declined and another nation rose in power. Do you remember what nation that is? That would be Babylon. Okay? Babylon rose in power. The second date that's really important to remember in the Old Testament is 587 BC. 587 is BC is when Babylon uh, came to Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and deported any remaining Israelites living in, in Judah at that time. They had been deporting Israelites for 20 years. And so it was in the sixth century when God used Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah to remind Judah of God's laws and their sins. And so they were sent into exile for 70 years. After 70 years, Jews were allowed to come back to, to Israel to rebuild their temple. Persia encouraged them to do that and to resume life. But they had been living in, in Babylon for 70 years. They had forgotten a lot of God's laws and standards. They had been raised in a foreign culture. And so God brought other prophets at that time to the Jews to remind them of God's laws. And so God used Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi to remind them of God's standards. Okay? Uh, David and, and J.D., you can sit down now. You did a great job. Okay. Um, in, the, uh, in the ancient world of the prophets, 
it was taken for granted that supernatural forces were at work and they were affecting human life. And so it was crucial to try to learn about these divine forces. Even among pagan religions, they, they felt this way, uh, as well as, as Israelites following uh, their God. Uh, but it was important to learn about these divine forces and, and understand how they work, but also how to contact them. And that was done, you know, people would try to... Uh, connect and contact these divine forces in a process called divinizing. And there were two main ways of, of divinizing that was practiced, or you may think of divination that uh, ties in with here. The most common form of divinizing was, was a term called uh, the inductive approach. And inductive was the, was the study of physical objects in order to try to discern God's will. Let me give you a, a simple illustration of that way of, of divinizing, of inductive divinizing in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Moses instructed priests to carry two objects in their breastplate called Urim and Thummim. I had a seminary professor say it was like holy dice because a priest would determine God's will by pulling the, those two items, and they were either rock or you know, stone or wood, and pull them out of his breastplate, and, and he would roll them, and depending on how they ended up rolling, that's how, that was one way God revealed his will to the, to the Israelites, okay, uh, and to the, to the Hebrews in the Old Testament. Uh, that was one example of, of inductive divinizing. Let me show you another example of, of inductive divinizing in a pagan religion, and I'm going to show it to you in a passage in the Bible um, that you probably have never noticed before. Um, so if you want to turn, or you can watch it on the screen, uh, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 21. Uh, Ezekiel, one of the major prophets. And, and in the, here's the setting of Ezekiel 21. God announces to Judah that he is going to use Babylon to, to punish them for their disobedience. Okay? Look, follow along starting at verse 18. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, mark out two roads for the sword of the king of Babylon to take, both starting from the same country. Make a signpost where the road branches off to the city. Mark out one road for the sword to come against Rabbah, of the Ammonites, and another against Judah and fortified Jerusalem. For the king of Babylon will stop at the fork in the road, at the junction of the two roads, to seek an omen. He will cast lots with arrows. He will consult his idols. He will examine the liver. Into his right hand will come the lot for Jerusalem, where he is to set up battering rams to give the command to slaughter to sound the battle cry, to set battering rams against the gates, to build a ramp, and to erect siege works. It will seem like a false omen to those who have sworn allegiance to him, but he will remind them of their guilt and take them captive. Here's what I want you to notice. God is going to use Babylon to destroy, to basically to, to punish Judah for their disobedience and their idolatry. So he's going to bring the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon is going to come to a fork in the road. And the, the, the king of Babylon will, will have to decide, is he going to go attack the Ammonites or is he going to go attack the Israelites? And so what is he going to do to try to determine God's will? Verse 21 says, he's going to cast lots with arrows. He will consult his idols. He will examine the liver. What does that last phrase mean? In ancient Mesopotamia, religious leaders, in trying to determine God's will, would often take an animal and sacrifice it, pull out its liver, and based on how the liver appeared, that was how they determined God's will. Okay? That was an example of inductive divinizing. Using a physical object, by looking at a physical object, they could determine God's will. People today go to fortune tellers and astrologers to find out what is in the future for me or tarot card readings, things like that. That's an example of inductive divinizing. Uh, 
A second mode of divinizing was intuitive, where, where messengers would hear God speak to them, and then they would pass that message on to other people or other groups of people. That method occurs most often in the Bible, and we see that as how God communicated with Old Testament prophets, and yet was very rare in other uh, Middle Eastern cultures. Well, obviously it was the God of Israel, who was Yahweh, who inspired Old, Tef Old Testament prophets and spoke through them. Yahweh literally means he who you know, uh, creates or he who uh, brings things to be. And one theme of the Old Testament is that God created a people of God from the descendants of Abraham. And Yahweh, the God of Israel, is really known by two qualities. One is his uh, compassion, and secondly, his jealousy. It was his compassion that freed the, the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. And he brought them to Mount Sinai. And it was at that point he established a covenant with his people. And by doing that, he gave them his laws. He ended up giving them the free land of Canaan where they would be able to live. A second quality of Yahweh is his jealousy, his, his zeal for them. When he gave them his laws, he instructed them not to worship any other gods not to, to create any idols. And that came from the Ten Commandments. By their obedience, by worshiping only one God, they would show all the other nations that they truly were the people of God. Earlier I mentioned that the job of a prophet was not to teach anything new or creative. It was simply to remind Israel of, of the Old Testament laws, remind them of the covenant God had established with them. Okay. Let me conclude by studying minor prophets this summer. We are going to be reminded of what it means to be the people of God. We're also going to be reminded and, and made aware of and, and warned of, of idols that ancient Israel worshipped that we're tempted to even worship today. That we will examine a, a different prophet every week. We will let you know which one is coming, okay? So you can find it in your Old Testament that you might be able to even read it that week. It's not going to be difficult. It's anywhere from 1 to 14 chapters. You can do it in a week's time. Okay? But as we study minor prophets, we see God's passion and his purpose in creating a people that honor him. With the end result, may we learn to be those same people. Pray with me, would you? Father, we thank you for your word in the Old Testament, your word that is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Your word is, is as active and true in the, in the times of the Old Testament, your truth and teachings. And may we learn this summer as we look at, at the minor prophets in the Old Testament and relate that to our lives today to see your truth and, and your call to, to follow you. May we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. J.D.? Worship you, I worship.
way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, Lord, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing it one more time. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Lord, we know that in every season, God, that you are exactly what your word says, that you are way maker. Lord, you are our light in the darkness. This season seems like everything's falling apart in this country, God. We know that we can cling to you. We know that you are our firm foundation, God, and that you cannot be shaken. The word cannot be shaken. We trust you. We trust your promises. We trust your nature, your character. We know that you are good, even if we can't necessarily see it. But we know that you're good. Help us to believe it. Thank you so much, God, that you have sustained us during this season of being apart. We look forward to next week. We can gather with one another again and worship you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.